Good evening. Um, I'd like to introduce a good friend of the college this evening, uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher, who's represented Wisconsin's 8th District in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2017. Uh, he served for seven years on active duty in the United States Marine Corps, including two deployments in Iraq. And he also served as the lead Republican staffer for the Middle East and counterterrorism on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and worked in the private sector at an energy and supply chain management company in Wisconsin. He currently serves on the House Armed Services Committee where he is ranking member of the Subcommittee on Military Personnel. He also serves on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. He earned a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, a master's degree in security studies from Georgetown University, another master's degree in strategic intelligence from National Intelligence University, and a PhD in international relations from Georgetown. Whatever he lacks because of these inferior academic institutions, <laughs> he, he more than makes up for uh, because of his natural intelligence, great leadership, and deep commitment to our republic. Uh, he is a Packers fan. He was born and raised in Green Bay, where he now lives with his wife, Anne, and daughter, Grace, who is one and a half, uh, but will be attending Hillsdale College. <laughs> Mike, welcome. Well, we'll see if she's smart enough to get into Hillsdale. Uh, she's good at destroying things in our house, so. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, taking time to be with me tonight, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to discussing a subject that has been the source of a lot of controversy on Capitol Hill, uh, but I think it's worth discussing in depth, and it's great to see, I got to meet some of the new students upstairs. Uh, I feel very old. Uh, I don't think I'm that far removed from being an undergrad, but I certainly, I'm sure I look like I, I am, but great to be with you here tonight. Uh, so I'd like to start uh, with um, a little bit of a clip, um, which is 2017's Wolf Warrior II, the second highest grossing Chinese film of all time. Earlier in the movie, the hero, a former People's Liberation Army special ops soldier named Lang Feng, sums up the movie's main message. The Americans are good for nothing. And posters promoting the movie feature the tagline, anyone who offends China, no matter how remote, must be exterminated. And before we play this clip, I just want to warn you that it, is, it has some graphic language. Uh, it, has, it is a fight scene. So if you're squeamish about such things, I would encourage you to either leave the room or avert your eyes, uh, but this is, this is important for reasons that will become clear uh, in a little bit. So this is a fight scene between uh, Lang Feng and an American mercenary named Big Daddy. Okay, not exactly subtle. Um, 
And remember, the second highest grossing Chinese movie of all time. For fans of the, you can, you can watch it all on YouTube if you're interested. If that really kind of whet your appetite for more action like that. Uh, for fans of 2015's original Wolf Warrior 1, the movie covered satisfying if familiar territory. And its message, <coughs> excuse me, may also be familiar territory for anyone who's watched the Chinese Communist Party's diplomatic corps operate over the past few years. Responding to CCP General Secretary Xi Jinping's call to display more fighting spirit, and inspired by Leng Feng's on-screen heroics, CCP officials have adopted a posture that you may have heard about, a posture called wolf warrior diplomacy. These CCP wolf warriors aggressively confront and criticize China's competitors abroad and promote pro-CCP propaganda on American social media platforms. And both the Wolf Warriors and the Wolf Warrior movies are part of a broader effort to discredit democratic and liberal values globally and to demonstrate the superiority of socialism with Chinese characteristics. Towards that end, the Wolf Warriors have blamed the US Army for the outbreak of coronavirus. They threaten nuclear strikes against American allies, Australia and Japan. And they've whitewashed the genocide in Xinjiang. But their favorite pastime, as you see in this slide here, is painting America as an imperialist, racist hellscape that is responsible for almost all the world's troubles. For example, uh, in the, the bottom right there, you see Zhao, uh, Zhao Lijian, the spokesman for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, who tweeted to his million followers in May of last year that America is the worst among developed countries in labor rights abuses, which can be traced back to its history of trafficking and abusing black slaves that spans hundreds of years. During protests throughout uh, America in the summer of 2020, the Wolf Warriors seized on American division. They hijacked slogans like Black Lives Matter. During the recent US-hosted Summit for Democracy, the Wolf Warriors posted political cartoons on Twitter criticizing US democracy with depictions of police officers choking the Statue of Liberty. But in the left there, you see a picture of what I believe to be the peak of Wolf Warrior diplomacy, which occurred in Alaska in March of last year. This was the first meeting between Biden administration officials and CCP officials. And there, the Chinese director of the Office of the Central Commission for Foreign Affairs, Yang Jiche, launched into a 16-minute wolf warrior diatribe claiming that America wields force and financial hegemony to smear China, topple foreign regimes, and massacre people of other countries. Yang argued that America has no authority to criticize China's human rights record because, quote, there are many problems within the United States regarding human rights, which is admitted by the US itself as well, such as Black Lives Matter, and he went on. Driving this propaganda is the CCP's all-consuming insecurity over its own legitimacy, both domestic and international. And as such, I think it'd be, be tempting for us, as outside observers, to just dismiss it, dismiss the wolf warriors as paranoid propagandists that are overplaying their hands. And in the process, they're producing jingoistic scenes like the one you just watched in the movie that are just as ham-handed as what we see in Chinese cinema. But I think that would be a mistake. It would be a mistake not only because these CCP wolf warriors are playing to a receptive audience in China, but also because they are weaponizing the worst beliefs of the woke left in America. In fact, the message of the CCP wolf warriors and the American woke left is nearly identical. And it goes something like this. America is a systemically racist, imperialist bully that is a force for evil in the world. And taking cues from postmodernism, critical race theory, the idea is that we need to transform America, dismantle its allegedly racist institutions in the name of diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI. And like a virus escaping from a laboratory, this ideology, which was once confined to college campuses, has now spread to the broader population. And no American institution is immune. Not sports, not corporate America, and not even the United States military, which is what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. Consider that in his first week on the job, uh, the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, ordered a 60-day stand down to confront extremism forcing all commanding officers to spend a day discussing extremism using a PowerPoint presentation prepared by the Joint Staff that included TED Talks asking, what is up with us white people? Which you see in this slide here. 
Austin also created a new position, a senior advisor for diversity, equity, and inclusion. He hired a man named Bishop Garrison for the position and to run his Countering Extremism Working Group. And though Secretary Austin could not define extremism, when I asked him about it five months after he ordered the extremism stand down, Bishop Garrison can. As you see in this tweet, uh, rather than focusing on violent or illegal behavior, his past tweets brand anyone who voted for former President Donald Trump as an extremist or a racist. The US Military Academy at West Point, a proud institution, likewise required cadets to attend a seminar on DEI and promoted presentations on white power at West Point and understanding whiteness and white rage. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, was questioned about this in front of the House Armed Services Committee on June 23rd, 2021, and here is how the exchange went, if you go to the next slide. Uh, and it is important that we train and we understand, uh, and I, I wanna understand white rage, and I'm white, and I wanna understand it. So what is it that caused thousands of people to assault this building and try to overturn the Constitution of the United States of America. What caused that? I want to find that out. I want to maintain an open mind here, and I do want to analyze it. It's important that we understand that, because our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Guardians, they come from the American people. So it is important that the leaders, now and in the future, do understand it. I've read Mao Zedong. I've read, I've read Karl Marx. I've read Lenin. That doesn't make me a communist. So what is wrong with understanding having some situational understanding about the country for which we are here to defend. And I personally find it offensive that we are accusing the United States military, our general officers, our commissioned, non-commissioned officers, of being, quote, woke or something else because we're studying some theories that are out there. That uh, Admiral Mike Gilday, who's the chief of naval operations, and recently is included Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist on his professional reading program, which is supposed to help sailors outthink our competition. Kendi, who is described as a leading historian according to one of the TED Talks in that PowerPoint presentation for the stand down on extremism, uh, has called Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett a white colonizer. He argues that capitalism is essentially racist. He warns that racism has spread to nearly every part of the body politic, threatening the life of human society with nuclear war and climate change. He calls for the creation of a department of anti-racism comprised of formally trained experts, no political appointees, no political oversight, with disciplinary tools to wield over and against policymakers and public officials who do not voluntarily change their racist policy and ideas. This created a lot of controversy, and Admiral Gilday was questioned about his decision in front of the Armed Services Committee on June 15, 2021, and this is how it went. Sir, I'd have to understand the context. That is a simple question. Made. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Admiral, here. this is a book I'm that you recommended here, sir, every defend, sailor in the United States Navy cherry read. picked quotes from somebody's book. I'm not going to do that. This is a bigger issue than Kendi's book. What this is really about is trying to paint the United States military, and in this case, the United States Navy is weak, as woke. And we've had sailors that spent 341 days at sea last year with minimal port visits, the longest deployments we've Admiral, had. Admiral, I've, I've met before. you. I respect we are you. Not weak. I remain astonished. We are strong and our parents Admiral, are I remain parents astonished parents that you put this book on a reading list and recommended that every sailor in the United States Navy read it. I'm also surprised that you said you, you read it. But I'm glad you brought up those points. You, sir? The Department of Defense, Admiral, the Department of Defense undertook the stand down because they understand that extremism detracts from military readiness. So if sailors accept Kendi's argument that America and the United States Navy are fundamentally racist, as you've encouraged them to do, do you expect that to increase or decrease morale and cohesion or even recruiting into the United States Navy? I do know this. Our strength is in our diversity. Okay, I believe if, if you really, and these were sort of the two, I, I think, most heated exchanges on this in, in the committee last year. Um, and it actually was more heated in the moment, uh, if you were there. I think Millie and Gilday's comments really get to the heart of the matter here. You see, when Chairman Millie compared reading woke text to reading Chairman Mao, I think he unwittingly gives away the game. See, we tend to read Mao and Lenin, at least from a military perspective, to understand our enemy's ideology and their tactics. We don't, we don't read Mao's talks at Yunnan for 
ideas about how to better run our own military. Yet that is precisely how Millie and Gilday are approaching these woke texts, as useful tools to help better run the Pentagon because of platitudes, like our diversity is our strength. And it should be noted here that Millie and Gilday are not simply pointing out the idea that I think all of us would agree with, that America's e pluribus unum melting pot is an asset for military recruitment, and that we should be proud that we live in a diverse nation that has a diverse military. Nor are they making the narrower argument that as the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan illustrate, a dearth of specialized linguistic and cultural skills can actually produce death on the battlefield. And there are certain diverse competencies that we need to develop, such as fluency in Mandarin or facility with cyber warfare, so that we're better prepared to defeat the CCP in a future war. That's not the claim being made. Instead, they're asking us to embrace a brand of identity politics that is fashionable on the left right now. One which judges people explicitly by the color of their skin, rather than treating everyone as equals or on their, judging them on their merits as individuals. They're also making specific and dubious claims about racial and gender diversity based on bad social science. And to illustrate this point, consider the recent comments of the Chief of Navy Personnel, Vice Admiral John Noel Jr., who suggested that we need to reinstate photos for selection boards so that we can factor race into promotion. You can look at a photo and look at the color of someone's skin and have that play a role in whether or not they get promoted. He, Noel also asserted, and here I quote, we know that diverse teams that are led inclusively will perform better. We know that diverse teams that are led inclusively will perform better. This claim appears to come from a report called Task Force One Navy. It was commissioned after the death of George Floyd. Task Force One Navy, if you read the report, concedes that the US Navy is more diverse than the US population. But then it offers 60 DEI recommendations, including de-emphasizing the use of standardized academic tests for Navy recruits, bias awareness training for all promotion board members, developing a subjectivity mitigation tool to combat unconscious biases. Task Force One Navy even quantifies Noel's assertion that diversity is our strength and Gilday's assertion by saying, quote, diverse teams are 58% more likely than non-diverse teams to accurately assess a situation. Here, Task Force One Navy cites a 2014 article from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences studying price bubbles in experimental markets. You see it on the slide here. Uh, the experiment took 180 strangers that were trained in business or finance and gave them exposure to diversity. But in the context of the experiment, exposure to diversity meant taking a white trader and having them mingle for a brief period of time with at least one other trader who was an ethnic minority. The test subjects then went to their individual computer terminals and made fake stock trades alone in these separate cubicles. So contrary to how the Navy portrays this report, the study actually says nothing about teams, decisions are being made alone by individuals, and nothing about assessing situations, certainly military situations. It's about pricing and purchasing decisions. Task Force One Navy also makes the claim, quote, gender diverse organizations are 15% more likely to outperform other organizations and diverse organizations, and diverse organizations are 35% more likely to outperform their non-diverse counterparts. So for one, this claim is actually completely inconsistent with the extant literature uh, on gender, at least. Uh, recent meta-analyses show zero effects for gender. Yet Task Force One Navy selectively cites a single 2015 study produced by McKinsey called Diversity Matters. For those who don't know McKinsey, it's a massive consulting firm. It does work for the Defense Department. It also does work for state-owned enterprises in China. It had a company retreat in Xinjiang province, which is the genocide capital of the world. So McKinsey's study, which you see here, uses something uh, called a, a modified version of something called the herfindel hirschman Index, which they use to quantify the racial composition of company boards and claim that racial diversity correlates with greater earnings before income and taxes. Yet the formula, if you actually run the numbers on this, and I would encourage you, you, uh, you, you precocious undergrads to check my math, uh, the formula is such that a company that has one white, one Native American, one Latino, and seven black members would score as less diverse 
than a board with six white and four black members. McKinsey's correlation is also likely weak because they lumped their data from 366 publicly traded companies into four quartiles, but they only compared the bottom quartile to the top quartile. So they conveniently omit half the data set, and we don't know the full story. Moreover, think about it. They're dis they don't discuss the idea of reverse correlation, right? It could reverse causation. It could be the fact that companies that perform better and have more money invest that money into DEI programs as opposed to DEI programs or board diversity producing the better financial performance. It doesn't take a PhD to recognize there are serious flaws with these studies. And it should alarm us that the same military leaders we trust to train our sons and daughters for war are building their DEI agenda upon a foundation of fringe history and shoddy social science. Their underlying assumption that we can generalize questionable findings from academia and the private sector to the specific business of asking men and women to kill and be killed for their country is an assault on common sense. Furthermore, those who view DEI as just a harmless addition to the many administrative tasks that the military currently has to do ignore recent evidence demonstrating DEI initiatives such as implicit bias training are either ineffective or actually in some cases, intensify intergroup hostility, which is the opposite of what they're trying to achieve. DEI is also driving right now important policy changes that negatively impact readiness by tying up commanders, units, and the military legal system with subjective investigations into alleged thought crimes. For example, based on the work of the Countering Extremism, work, uh, the Countering Extremism Working Group run by Bishop Garrison, on December 20th of last year, Secretary Austin changed the Defense Department's policy for countering extremism to include prohibiting likes and retweets of social media content that's deemed to promote extremist activities. So this could potentially include opposition to vaccine mandates. It could include opposition to wokeness training. All the services right now are trying to figure out how to implement this guidance, but notably, commanding officers will now be responsible for policing social media use by their sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines for any problematic content. Here again, we have bad social science in the background. DOD's understanding of extremism leading to this change was largely informed by the civilian database that's out there. It's called the Profiles of Individual Radicalization in the United States, or PIRUS. The researchers who maintain PIRUS actually don't give you access to their underlying data set from 2019 to 2021, which is important because a lot of what's telling the story in the data set is January 6th of uh, 2021. Uh, they have warned in the past that their data may not be a representative sample because their measure of extremism mostly reflects news reporting trends over time because it's far easier to identify individuals who are associated with the groups that are under intense media scrutiny. And in 2021, they ignored their own past warnings about subsampling their data set. Basically, they said in the past, in 2016, I believe, don't just grab military veterans from this data set and run analyses on that. That's not what it's built for. But that's exactly what they did in order to help Secretary Austin's investigation and then make unconditional claims about growing extremism in the military. The Center for Naval Analysis, which is a federally funded research and development center, also produced a report on racial extremism in the military. The report says that its most critical recommendation is the recognition that the problem of racial extremism is actually not one of just a few bad apples, but is a far more pervasive challenge. But the only evidence that's offered for this sweeping claim is a footnote linking to an article from the leftist magazine, The New Republic, which references the opinion of a progressive art historian from a progressive think tank. So my point is that with such poor empirical and methodological foundations, at best, DEI, as practiced by the DOD right now, will waste service member time and taxpayer money. At worst, DEI will undermine the foundation of our modern all-volunteer force. This force is by design an exclusive, not an inclusive organization. I believe we are lucky to draw from a diverse population but we do not want the US military to look like a representative sample of the population. We want it to be the best and the brightest, regardless of skin color. 
The US military is an elite and meritocratic organization where only the most fit, disciplined, and lethal individuals should thrive, regardless of skin color. And for this reason, the military obsessively measures things like pull-ups, marksmanship, a general ability to endure pain. Put differently, diversity may be a strength for America, but it cannot be an organizing principle for the Pentagon because actual strength, physical strength, mental strength, overall military end strength is our strength. And DEI initiatives, as currently conceived, risk sapping this strength. By co-opting a woke obsession with racial and gender diversity, the Pentagon DEI evangelists are ironically stifling the very type of diversity that might actually improve military performance, which is intellectual diversity. But that, of course, is, is the point. The growing DEI bureaucracy inside the military is the same woke commissariat that has put an ideological straitjacket on America's elite educational institutions. And it tolerates no dissent from its orthodoxy. It promotes a culture of conformity that elevates the mindless repetition of dogmas over a true exchange of ideas. And such an environment also risks further politicizing our officer corps in the military, which could sap morale, sow division between officers and enlisted men, and damage civil military relations. To illustrate this, I'll go to the next slide. This is a November 2021 poll from the Reagan Institute, which indicates the number of Americans with a great deal of trust and confidence in the military has declined from 70% in 2018 to 45% today. That is a conspicuous and perhaps unprecedented drop. And confidence is lower among young Americans, Americans under uh, 30, than an, among any other demographic subgroup. Now, a few things could be driving this drop, right? I th it, 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 it could be Afghanistan and the perceived incompetence after Afghanistan, but I guarantee you some of the divisive debates we've seen about DEI are driving some of that drop as well. But if this trust continues to drop, it will make it difficult to recruit and retain talented warfighters. Additionally, if the DEI agenda sends the signal that to get promoted, one must positively affirm progressive dogmas or spend more time on inclusivity training rather than training for war, we'll get fewer warfighters and more risk-averse political drones in charge of our military. Because warfighting, not DEI, must be the North Star of our military. As Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication 1, warfighting seen on this side says, the military has two basic functions, waging war and preparing for war. Any military activities that do not contribute to the conduct of a present war are justifiable only if they contribute to preparedness for a possible future one. And my concern is that by distracting from warfighting or alienating current or prospective warfighters, DEI will undermine readiness at a time when DOD is struggling with preventable peacetime accidents that are actually killing more service members than combat. For example, in 2017, the USS Fitzgerald and the USS McCain collided with merchant vessels in separate incidents. It killed 17 sailors. The official Navy investigation into these described the accidents as avoidable. It cited complacency, substandard training, and a, last, a lack of basic seamanship skills. A recently released command investigation of the burning of the USS Bonham Richard found multiple leadership failures and an absence of basic knowledge. A separate congressional investigation into the culture of the surface Navy after all these accidents, identified an insufficient focus on warfighting skills, the perception of a zero defect mentality accompanied by a culture of micromanagement and oversensitivity and responsiveness to modern media culture. culture. And then of course there is the fiasco of our humiliating surrender and botched withdrawal in Afghanistan, which Chairman Milley tried to spin as a logistical success. He called it a logistical success. So calling the Donner Party a logistical success. Half the people made it, but the other half. Uh, as shown in this slide, if you go to the next slide, uh, this has headlines from CCP-run newspapers. Uh, the CCP Wolf Warriors immediately exploited the situation to send a message to Taiwan that America cannot be counted on in a crisis. So with all of these self-inflicted wounds, the CCP Wolf Warriors obviously sense that we look weak on the world stage. Which brings me to the final concern about DEI and DOD. When our militaries embrace a woke DEI agenda against this backdrop of mounting military failures, they're validating the propaganda 
of our primary adversary, which of course makes us look even weaker. And this matters because the competition between the United States and China is not simply a military competition. It is at its heart an ideological competition between two fundamentally incompatible systems of government and at stake are values such as freedom of conscience, human rights, or the basic idea that objective truth even exists. And if we give in to the wolf warrior and woke warrior fiction that America is a racist country whose military is endemic with white supremacists, we will have unilaterally disarmed in that ideological combat. And if we succumb to the delusion that America is irredeemably racist, we give up one of our most potent ideological weapons, which is the fact that America is still a free, multi-ethnic society that remains a dream destination for people all over the world. While the CCP is a profoundly racist and chauvinist entity, one that has enslaved a million Uyghur and Kazakh Muslims in pursuit of the destruction of non-Han Chinese languages and cultures. And so, right now, the PLA is preparing for a war over Taiwan that appears more likely by the day. I would submit to you the war has already begun. We're in phase zero operations, and the CCP wolf warriors have launched a preemptive ideological strike designed to weaken America's will to fight by poisoning many of our citizens against our nation. And since war remains primarily a contest of wills, by weakening America's national pride through wokeism, the CCP thereby increases its chances of winning World War III, either by defeating an unready American military in combat or convincing America's leaders to surrender without fighting. And all of this, of course, has a demoralizing impact on our service members and potential military recruits. After all, why volunteer to fight for a country that's racist? Why die for this country if you don't believe that we are the good guys? And speaking of good guys versus bad guys, and I'll end with this. Recently, wait, just pause it for one sec. Uh, this, is the, this is the actual highest uh, grossing Chinese film of all time. It became that, uh, I think, late last year. This is 2021's The Battle at Lake Changin. It's a three-hour film set in the Korean War, or as the CCP calls it, the war to resist American aggression and aid Korea. It surpassed Wolf Warrior II as the highest grossing Chinese movie of all time. It actually stars the same actor that you saw at the beginning of this presentation who plays Lang Feng in Wolf Warrior. And here is the trailer. Play, play the trailer. Bay films look understated. Uh, so this was financed in part by the CCP uh, as part of their massive propaganda campaign leading up to the 100th anniversary of the party's founding. And it depicts the 17-day battle of the Chosen Reservoir, where you had about 120,000 Chinese troops surprise and encircle the 30,000 UN command troops. They forced a fighting retreat from Chosen to the port of Hungham. Uh, the CCP-run uh, Global Times praised the movie for 
uh, with, and the movie portrays Chinese troops winning against impossible odds for pushing, quote, the patriotic sentiment of the people across the country to a peak amid the tense China-US competition and China's effective control of the epidemic. So the message of the movie is clear. China is ready for war, and America can be beaten. We've beaten the Americans before. We can beat them again. Yet in their wolf warrior fervor, I believe the CCP missed the point of the battle that us Marines today know as Frozen Chosen. At Chosen, 8,000 Marines fought their way through 12 Chinese divisions, not only surviving 20 below temperatures and hand-to-hand -hand combat, but also inflicting massively disproportionate casualties on the enemy. A lot of the Chinese divisions never got back in the fight. They did this fighting as fire teams, squads, and platoons that had recently been integrated because the armed forces led the way for racial integration in 1948. As Baker 17 Mortar Platoon Commander First Lieutenant Joseph Owen described in his chosen memoir called Colder Than Hell, great book, quote, the politicians had slashed military budgets so deep that many units were less than half strength. We could use all the men we could get. The overriding thought was that white or black, a Marine was a Marine. These chosen few held the line against communism. And with a basic faith in the goodness of our nation, now we must do the same today. So thank you for listening to me, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh oh, Jack Butler wants to ask a question. I've never met you before. Um, <laughs> so you saw, particularly in that second clip of the hearings that you showed, that uh, one, one obstacle that will be faced in attempts to reform this problem you've identified is that the, the military command are interpreting criticism of the, of the DEI infection of the military as criticism of the military per se. Right. So I guess my question is two-pronged. Two One, how do you sort of advance an argument and advance policies uh, to sort of head that off? And on the other hand, how do you resist a kind of nihilistic temptation to kind of uh, accept that like the, the, the rot is so deep that the military almost can't be salvaged and like only a just humiliating loss will shock America out of its uh, complacency in this regard. Uh, thank you, Jack, for that question. Well, first, I do think it's fair to characterize some of this as a criticism not of the military writ large, which is a large, diverse institution with a lot of different viewpoints, but in some ways as a, a criticism of the general officer and flag officer class, who at times I fear are just bending to current political pressures, and in some cases trying to appease their progressive political bosses. And I think that's a fair criticism in some cases. In fact, I, I would suspect, uh, uh, I, I would suspect that the CNO doesn't have sort of a thorough understanding of everything that's in I Ibram X. Kendi's book. So I think the best way to move beyond the perception that you're, in, you're criticizing the military as a whole is to just point out the cracks in the foundation of a lot of this work, which is what I tried to do a little bit there. And I would say just talk to service members about their own experiences, right? I mean, I served in diverse units downrange in both of my deployments to Iraq. We had, we had a very diverse units. Everyone worked together. Uh, it would shock me based on that experience that white supremacy was endemic in the United States military. And I think they're trying to make the claim that because you had a certain number of military veterans involved in January 6, that that somehow means that extremism is endemic in the military. And that, I think, is a distinction that needs to be parsed a, a little bit more. Because actually, if you look at a study that I think is a little bit better on this, George Washington University maintains an extremism database. And they say the best comparison may actually be uh, male veterans in the entire population versus male veterans who participate in January 6. And there the numbers are, are almost identical. It's actually less for January 6. It's 14% compared with 13.1%. So I guess I, I just think there's a lot of serious work that needs to be done exposing the bad methods and bad history behind this. And I think that's a way to get at that distinction. What was the second part of your question, Jack? I'm sorry. So how do you resist this kind of uh, nihilistic temptation to believe that the rot is set so deep that only a sort of massive national hum humiliation will, will shock the country out of it? 
And are you talking about the rot just in general with warfighting competency? Yeah, well, restricted to that, uh, it seems unfair to do otherwise, at least on this occasion. Yeah. Well, I think right now we are, we're undergoing a massive transition in the military, right? We spent the last two decades fighting largely counterinsurgency and counterterrorism wars in the Middle East. And all of the services are struggling with how do we do great power competition or deterrence by denial in Indo-PACOM effectively. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that we will have a massive disaster. I think there are a lot of people working overtime behind the scenes, both in Congress, front of the scenes usually in Congress, but also in the Pentagon to ensure that doesn't happen. And time and again, I mean, we even saw this in Iraq. We had early disasters. The military proved to be a learning organization over time. We had good leadership uh, at various points that resisted withering political pressure. I remember what General Petraeus went through. We called General Petraeus when he came here to testify on the Hill. So I do ultimately have faith in the military's ability to adapt and avoid disaster. But if the force becomes more politicized, that is what concerns me. And ultimately, I think it comes down just to the quality of the young men and women that we're recruiting into the military. And there I'm actually pretty optimistic. Probably the best part of my job is that uh, I get to nominate kids to go to our service academies. And I'm just telling you, I mean, granted, the, you know, this is just the last five years I've been in office. They keep getting more and more impressive. So uh, there, I think, if we give those kids leadership worthy of their innate talent and patriotism, I think we can avoid that, avoid that disaster. The final thing I say, Jack, is I really do think the time has come because we are losing talent, uh, top-level talent uh, in the military because our personnel system has not really been substantially reformed for decades now. We're still operating under something called DOTMA, the Defense Officer per Personnel Management Act. That needs a comprehensive reform. We need to reform our war colleges to ensure that we're sending the best and the brightest to go to war college and they're actually studying war. I believe our war colleges in many cases have become sort of mediocre, civilianized master's degree granting organizations. And in many cases, people that we send to the war colleges then get out of the military after we've invested that time in them. That was not the case, for example, when Eisenhower went to the War College and graduated first in his class. We don't publicize the rank structure. Tom Ricks has done some good work on this. So I do think it's gonna require a broader reform to how we manage careers in the military to make sure that we're not losing good people and by extension, not losing a future war. I guess the alternative is to have that shock to the system that will wake us out of our slumber, but I prefer to avoid that. Sir. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I, I see a problem in that the best schools, Ivy schools, have uh, actually set aside more qualified students to accommodate the diversity agenda. And could I care less if my alma mater is ultimately made up of half second generation Asian immigrant kids? I could not care less because I respect meritocracy. And I'm wondering if this uh, plague against meritocracy isn't now descending on the service academies. And if that can't be our last best great hope to draw the line, maybe even to legislate that admission to the service academies will depend on nothing more than meritocracy. And diversity is not the definition of meritocracy. Uh, well, I think it has uh, descended on the service academies. Um, there hasn't been a comprehensive analysis of it. It's based mostly on sort of anecdotal evidence. But I, I think any examination of the curriculum at various service academies, a lot of which has come to light in, in our hearings, and it's not just West Point. The Naval Academy has, had, has, has seen this as well, um, shows that that's the case. I actually tried to submit an amendment in last year's National Defense Authorization Act to do exactly that. I believe the Coast Guard was the last academy that actually had it in its charter that admission could not, there could be no racial discrimination for admission, right? I.e., you just you have to admit people based on whether they are the most qualified, whether they're white, they're black, they're Asian, or whatever their, their, uh, their racial status is. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to reinstate that for uh, admission for all of the service academies. It got buried in the NDAA process. Uh, I forget who tanked it, but uh, it did not survive first contact with uh, uh, with the enemy uh, in, in that case. But I, th I, th I think you are seeing that. Um, and I, I mean, it's a function of the, the 
the, um, the faculty uh, at these organizations as well. Sir, you had, oh, I thought you had a, your hand up before. Um, so, so, so building a little bit on the last question, um, so uh, obviously you think that there are problems with our war colleges and, and, yeah. and service academies, um, and, and uh, you touched on the, the faculty problem a little bit, but, but so um, what's, your, what's your candid assessment of how bad things are at the service academies and, um, it, you know, you, you said we're sending all these very, very bright students to, to the service academies, and this is a source of optimism for you. Um, but also, if um, DEI is, is sort of infecting them in some ways, is, is that sapping your optimism? Um, and, and if it is, what do you think, A, what should students at service academies do about it? What should the faculty at service academies do about yeah. it? And also, what should Congress do about it? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it's hard for me to disaggregate my specific concern with, the, with service academies from my general concern over higher education in general, and I think the service academies reflect that. In general, I think, in fact, the biggest thing I hear from constituents in my district, which is actually, the biggest thing besides, we need more workers, where are people that are willing to work that have basic skill set, is related to the second thing, which is that, you know what, not all kids need to go to a four-year college. Now, there are exceptions that prove the rule. Hillsdale is a shining exception, and I think has proven its value time and again, but I really think the pandemic has uh, forced a lot of people to question the value of higher education when their kids were, in some cases, being forced to sequester in their dorm rooms while still doing online instruction uh, and spending a lot of money uh, in the process. So I have a lot of concerns in general about higher education and how disconnected it's become from setting kids up for success and survival in a very difficult and competitive uh, global economy. Specific to the service academies, um, I mean, listen, you know, if you're a, an 18 year old kid from Northeast Wisconsin, it's still a phenomenal deal to be able to go to Annapolis on the taxpayer dime for four years. And if you're motivated, you're gonna get a great education. Just as you'll get a great education if you go to Brown or, well, maybe not Berkeley, I don't know. Uh, but it, you, you can do it. Uh, and, and these kids are motivated in, in a lot of cases, but. I just don't think, given the demands of what, that we are facing right now vis-a-vis -vis China and the potential for a massive conflict that will start with Taiwan but will not stay confined to Taiwan, Las Vegas rules will not apply in the Taiwan conflict. What happens there will not stay there. Our homeland will be affected. You can expect preemptive cyber attacks against the homeland. I just think we are going to have to up our game across all fronts, our physical standards, our academic standards. We have a lot of remedial English that needs to happen at all of these service academies, unfortunately. And finally, one thing that we're not doing, either in the intelligence, I'd be curious to get your take, but my sense, either in the intelligence community or in the military, is developing that cadre of regional and linguistic experts in the same way we invested a lot of time and money to develop no kidding experts on the Soviet Union in the early Cold War. In the new Cold War, I don't think we have that same group of people that truly understand, for example, how Chinese Communist Party United Front work uh, actually operates around the world. And that's a process that actually needs to start at our service academies, and we need to develop career paths for those people to become true experts and stay in the military, as opposed to just rotating them every two years to unconnected assignments that don't actually develop them into the professionals that we need. Other questions? I have no sense of what time it is, so. Uh, talk too much. So, yeah. You might not be familiar. Um, I said you might not be familiar because you're from an inferior branch. <laughs> but could you speak to the Army Combat Fitness Test? Yeah. Which was supposed to be like a level playing field, and now there's like significant resistance to it. I, I I've been following this issue for the last year. Um, so for me, I'm biased because as a Marine, so I didn't come from a military family, right? Uh, I come from a family of. Uh, OBs in Northeast Wisconsin who also have a pizza place. So pizza and babies, the Gallagher's always deliver. That's the family model. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I, you know, I was, a, let's say, a, a bookish kid growing up. I, I, you know, I played basketball, I played golf, but I was not, I was not like a, a star athlete. And I never lifted weights growing up at all. So the first time I got on a pull-up bar, I think I did like three pull-ups, right? 
That's embarrassing if you're a Marine. You need to at least be doing 20 when you go down to officer candidate school. And that was a tough thing for me to do. But that's a beautiful experience. You have to work to that. And that's a standard that's consistent across all Marines. Now, they give you a little bit of a cheat as you start to get older. It, you, it's, a, it's a weighted range. But for me, it doesn't make any sense to have different physical standards. We, we obviously have different physical standards for male and females. Females, when I was in the Marine Corps, could do flexed arm hangs for a variety, a variety of reasons. But when we allow people to start carving out, you know, I'm gonna do a, a row as opposed to a run, or I think in the Air Force, you can choose your own adventure of row, swim, run, play nine holes, you know? Uh, that to me under, undermines something that's beautiful and essential about the military which is everyone is held to the same standards. Um, and certainly on the military personnel committee, my goal this year is to take every uh, physical fitness test for all of the branches and see how they stack up. My sense is that without those uh, exceptions, the new Army combat fitness test is actually difficult uh, in a lot of ways. Oh, it has gotten easier. Oh, interesting. You have to tell Tony in our office that. He was making the case that it actually got harder from before. Uh, yeah. The problem is that yeah. you, you have a lack of adaptability and a lack of training. And so there is this huge resistance from Congress Interesting. saying that it is not uh, accommodating a diverse population. But if you look at all the studies and all the data from the Army, you know, it's creating better war fighters. You know? think, of, think about like what, a, what a crazy and in some ways racist argument that is, right? To say certain populations can't perform at the same level with the right training. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. The Marine Corps has actually gone in the opposite direction. I actually think the Marine Corps' physical fitness test has gotten harder. They replaced the sit-up requirement with a plank, and you have to hold a plank for a long period of time, and it went from 20 pull-ups to 22 pull-ups. So that, to me, is the right way to go. I mean, we have this sort of fantasy that reappears every few years. H.R. McMaster calls it a vampire fallacy, which is that war is gonna become so high, highly technologically developed that you're gonna sort of uh, negate the human dimension of war. That is just certainly not the case, or at least that's not something we could confidently predict. And I think future war is gonna get more demanding both physically and cognitively. So I don't see any case for diluting the standards of the physical fitness test right now. And now I'm like, after going from three pull-ups initially and embarrassing myself, I'm now like obsessed with pull-ups. <laughs> I have a pull-up bar in my office. I have, this, I have this recurring dream where I'm just doing infinity pull-ups every night. So if, if I can do it, then anybody can do it. Um, I, had a, I had a practical question before I would point out that um, uh, several people from the military academies are transferring to Hillsdale. Oh, uh, there you go. Military academies. Yeah. Um, Practical questions. How deeply embedded is this in the military from your point of view, and how quickly could it actually uh, erode military readiness in war fighting? But secondly, connected to that, the reverse, um, based on how deeply it's embedded, could it be corrected? And how quickly? And what, what is your assessment of actually how far this has gone? And how My honest assessment is that it is not yet deeply embedded, that it is mostly right now a top-down thing. We have it, because this honestly has, I was thinking about this the other day, when I, when I, when I first ran, we, we were talking about this a little bit, when I first ran for Congress in 2016, the arguments we had in my campaign were about policy, right? There were, it was healthcare, social security, debt, spending issues. And I sort of like, I long for the days of, of having a debate about Obamacare and social security. Because now we're having these debates that simply we weren't having even five years ago about whether America is an evil country, the nature of knowledge itself. And so that's been a quick change. It's been quickly embraced by a lot of leaders in the Democratic Party right now. And so I think you're seeing top-level leadership in the military respond to that demand signal and right now try to sort of impose it on the force. But I don't think it is yet deeply embedded uh, in the force uh, right now. And I think, you're, you know, you're probably your 20-year-old Lance Corporal, you know, probably sat there watching these PowerPoints and the stand down and, and was, was thinking about other things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
why I think, so James Lindsay has an interesting point where he sort of talks about a lot of this stuff, which people dismiss as harmless, as a Trojan horse. Um, and what comes out of the horse is not a bunch of warriors or assassins in this case, but a bunch of bureaucrats that quickly take over an organization. And I think it would be naive to assume, since we have examples of this stuff taking over other organizations, private sector organizations, certainly higher education has been taken over by this in a lot of cases, to think that something similar could not happen in the military. So I think, how could that happen? That demand signal from the general and flag officer class continues. The bureaucracy, uh, many of which is new bureaucracy that was just created in the last year, continues to expand and more money continues to flow to these programs. And as we see in every government program, once you create a program, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to kill it. And that's really the challenge we face going forward. And again, I just, I really worry it's going to create racial tension in the military where it did not exist before. And that's a huge problem. One more. Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering if you could touch on kind of the transgender, gender transition issue in this. I mean, that's obviously a big part of the wokeness. Um, it might be related to the last question in terms of, you know, how kind of deeply embedded is this? How does this impact morale? That kind of thing. Well, it's obviously, it's been a huge source of controversy uh, in the military. There's been policy changes back and forth. And the question is, well, I think, I think most reasonable people would agree with the idea that the military should not be in the business of paying for gender reassignment surgery. Uh, and I, I think regardless of whether you actually think um, you know, transgender individuals should be allowed to serve or should serve in their, their actual gender and then you know, after they get out they can do whatever they want, I think at a minimum you have to say taxpayer dollars should not be uh, should not be funding gender reassignment surgery, and that's a concern. So I would sort of land on that point. Um, right now, we're going back in the direction of sort of trying to accommodate uh, uh, the transgender community and allow them to serve in the military. I do worry about the effect that's going to have, certainly on combat units uh, in the military, many of whom do not, uh, still don't have women uh, in certain units. So for example, in the Marine Corps, uh, we have, I think, at least two or three female officers that have graduated from infantry officer course uh, that was a, it actually took a longer time for them to do that than uh, to graduate from ranger school, which is further proof that the Marine Corps is harder than the Army. Uh, uh, but I think there are legitimate concerns about the effect that opening the floodgates for um, a transgender, certainly in combat units and infantry units, would have on unit morale and cohesion. But I think all of us would say, you know, all of these, everyone deserves to be treated with respect. It's just a question of, in the military, and when it comes to taxpayer dollars, what we do with that. In the a couple of questions ago, you were talking about it's not that embed, wokeism is not as embedded deep down and broad. Yeah. And so if it can vanish, is that relative, or would you say it could be relative, to who is the president? Yeah. And what side of the aisle the president aligns with? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, command, the, the president is the commander in chief. He sets the tone for the military. He also just sets the tone and the credibility of American military deterrence more broadly, right? What the president says, how he acts, how he conducts himself uh, has a profound impact on the ability of our young men and women to accomplish the very dangerous mission we're asking them to accomplish. And my concern with President Biden right now is not just this embrace of a woke agenda that I feel is incredibly divisive, that I hear every day from parents in my districts are worried about it in K through 12 education and things like that, that at its core I think is anti-American. Uh, it's been referred to as uh, racial Marxism in many cases. But I also just think the president doesn't have a basic understanding of deterrence and is recapitulating some of the worst mistakes that we learned in the Obama administration. I think the collapse in Afghanistan will have a profound impact on our ability to deter Russia and China. I think if the Ukraine situation gets out of control, and remember, this president gave a gift to Vladimir Putin 
by allowing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline to go forward, right? If that situation devolves into crisis, it makes it more likely that Xi Jinping will try to effectuate forcible reunification of Taiwan with the mainland. And so absolutely, I think the president, not just through policies, whether he supports DEI, but the overall strength that he or she projects on the world stage can have a profound impact on our military, from the general officer class down to the lowest PFC and Lance Corporal that's at the tip of the spear. Final question? Thank you much for doing this. I have a question about kind of the good diversity you were talking about, about how we need to have language skills and technical skills for cyber. How do we promote those good kind of diversity without leading it to, into DEI? Uh, well, one thing that we've done in the last five years on the Armed Services Committee is we've given the Pentagon authorities to be able to hire people who are mid-career professionals, particularly cyber professionals, and bring them into the service at a higher level so that you can imagine someone who's at the top of their game working for you know, Microsoft or Google or some, or some big tech company is probably, and making a lot of money, is probably not interested in going to boot camp and being a, an E1 or an O1, uh, right? So you need some flexible hiring authority so that person could come in as a major or a lieutenant colonel or you know, in the reserves or in the National Guard and things like that. So we've actually given the Pentagon the authority to do that, and I think there's a lot of bipartisan support behind that idea. What we don't actually know is in the last three or so years, have they used that authority and whether it's worked in the way we hope it does. So right now, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, for example, just released a new vision for overhauling the personnel management system uh, by the end of the decade. And that's one of the things he talks about, is really taking advantage of that, where could we bring some non-traditional people into the Marine Corps, you know, people who don't want to run around and do pull-ups and have purple hair and things like that, right? The question is whether making someone immediately a major or a lieutenant colonel or a colonel will undermine the esprit de corps of the force because they haven't had to go through foundational experiences like boot camp or officer candidate school, right? So right now, the only way in the Marine Corps you can avoid that right now is if you're a member of the Marine Corps band uh, at 8th and I. Um, because the Marine Corps, want, I mean, the, the Marine Corps band plays for the president. They actually go out and they recruit world-class musicians. And in general, though there may be some exceptions, world-class musicians that could be hired by symphonies in New York and Chicago are not necessarily the same ones that are, that are volunteering to go to Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego or Paris Island, right? So that's the question, and there are people on both sides of that debate. Um, I think it probably makes sense to bring those people in in a civilian capacity and have more of a purple force that works for all the different services as opposed to sort of magically saying, you're a Marine, you're a, you're a, you're a soldier, you're an airman, without having to go through those experiences. But we're very much trying to figure that out right now. And one of the things we're doing in this year's NDAA is trying to get an assessment from all the services as to whether they've used this authority and whether it's actually made any difference at all. As for language and, and really uh, China experts, that's a harder thing, right? I was a regional affairs officer for the Middle East, but that really didn't impact my career assignment. Um, in fact, after I did a tour, I did my first three years mostly in the Middle East deploying. I did a tour here in the intelligence community, and then I wanted to deploy again to the Middle East, but the Marine Corps wanted to send me to Okinawa uh, to do a staff job making PowerPoint slides for a general, and I didn't want to do that. So a lot of times there's still just a vast disconnect between people's interest and their, their expertise and their career assignment. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, they're called military orders for a reason, right? Like, it's not necessarily, at some point, it's no longer a negotiation, but given how many opportunities these young um, men and women have, particularly in the officer corps, I think we got to be more flexible in terms of keeping them in. I, I'm going to end with one uh, yeah. uh, last question for you that um, several of my own students, I know there are others, uh, that have gone into the military and have gone through Quantico and have now in their assignments. Um, they don't want to stay. They want to get out of there as fast as they can. But they went there for the right reasons. Yeah. And um, what, what, what would you tell them? Well, I think you take, it, you take it three years at a time, right? Your general assignment is three years, sometimes two years. I don't think you need to commit 
When I went in, I was convinced I was just gonna do three and a half years and get out, go to business school, make tons of money, endow a building at Hillsdale, perhaps. No, that didn't happen. Uh, um, but I, I stayed in for four more years because I had a great experience. I worked for, uh, when General Petraeus became commander of CENTCOM, I got onto his, his assessment team. He did this comprehensive review of the region. I worked for General HR McMaster, and he really convinced me to stick around for a little bit longer. And so, and honestly, had the Marine Corps met me halfway for my assignment after that, I would have stayed in for at least two more years, maybe three. And at that point, I would have been at 10 years. And once you're on the other side of 10 years, it's easy to talk yourself into going for the full 20, right? So again, I think if, if we're able to reform the personnel management system, and I, I think you're gonna be able to keep those people a little bit longer. And my approach was always, if I can do what I wanna do in uniform, I, I'd rather stay in uniform, because uh, it's fun. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I had a blast uh, whenever I was deployed downrange. I didn't want to spend my days inside an office doing, doing PowerPoint stuff, though. So that's, that's kind of the difficult thing. But um, I think also, if we can't keep those people on active duty, we need to do everything humanly possible to keep them in the reserves. And I did not stay in the reserves. I think that was an error in retrospect. Because if the proverbial stuff hits the fan in Taiwan with China, we're gonna be activating a lot of our reservists and we're gonna need a lot of very talented people whose presumably private sector experience will help them be, bring unique insights to the military in a conflict like that. We're gonna need them in the fight. And that's where I, I actually think we can do a lot of creative things. And the final thing I'd say for the intelligence community, I think there's a lot we can do to leverage people in the financial community and in the private sector and draw on their insight routinely, which we're not doing right now. So not an easy silver bullet answer to your question, but um, it's going to require some creativity and flexibility from the services. Great. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Congressman. Thank you. Appreciate it.